question to ask you in light of this morning's gospel text, this extraordinary exorcism of a man in the Gentile land of Jerusalem. Here's the question. What is your trust in God based upon? Is it based upon something valuable? This gospel story, which almost sounds like a folk tale, really, is not one I expect you to believe word for word. But the storytelling is so vivid, and the situation of the possessed man is so dreadful. No doubt Christians throughout the centuries have hoped that Jesus would be able to turn to them in their own personal hells and say the words that he said to this possessed man. I have certainly met, myself, people whose lives were just as tormented as this man from Gerard. Just a few lines earlier in Luke's Gospel text, as Jesus and company were sailing across the Sea of Galilee from Jewish territory into Gentile territory, Jesus had to command the waves and the storms to calm down. Because the boat was sinking, and the lives of him and his friends were threatened. No doubt that story... And the story we just heard are meant to reveal that Jesus is powerful, has power over both nature and this dark, spiritual underworld. Really, that Jesus possesses an authority and a power beyond our comprehension. I think that's the point of at least these two stories. And so we can ask the disciples, we can ask the man once possessed, tell us, is your trust in God built on something valuable? And imagine being in the place of those characters and having to answer that question, trying to form answer to us. If I'd been a disciple on the sea, as Jesus had calmed the storm and the waves, I would have said, I trust in Jesus because he saved my skin. And if I had been the man once possessed, living among the tombs in the wilds of Gerasa, I would have said, well, I would have been able to shut me up. This man transformed me and healed me and sent away all that was tormenting my soul. Jesus knew when he told this man, Go and tell everyone what God has done for you. Jesus knew that this man, going back to his Gentile neighbors, would have shared a redemption story unlike any other that they had ever heard. The trust that such people had in God was based upon their transformative experiences of Jesus. That was about 2,000 years ago. And here we are, 2,000 years later, still reading those stories and still talking about them. So I have to ask you today, 2,000 years later, is your trust in God based upon something valuable? Maybe your trust in God is based upon the faith that you experienced in your family, your childhood, growing up. That's valid. Maybe your trust in God has developed as you have grown up with your spouse or a close friend. It's opened up a whole way of seeing life that you haven't imagined before. That's valid. Maybe your trust in God is based upon life and community, a life shared wrapped around with sacred tradition and the words of scripture and the sacraments and the seasons of the year. Maybe that's what you built your faith upon and that's valuable too. Maybe your trust in God is also based upon experience. Hard-earned experience. Maybe it's based upon the experience 
a great failure. Or maybe your trust in God is based upon an experience of great hope. Maybe you've experienced a great season of suffering, or change, or growth, or maturity, or maybe you've recovered from a profound illness or addiction. Maybe your faith is based on any number of those things, and God was there with you in those times. Maybe God was there for prayer. Maybe God was there for friends. Family. Maybe God was there in community. Maybe God was there in ways you could hardly put words to. But yes, God was there, and that is the God you'll say, I trust. That is the God who saved my life. That's very, very good. We've been reading the Acts of the Apostles this summer. And as I've said before, in an odd way, the life of the baby church has started to follow the career of Jesus. Healing, casting out evil, transforming people by proclaiming the good news of God to those who need to hear it. Just last week we heard the story of Stephen, the first martyr who served as a servant minister, a deacon in the early church died just like Jesus did by saying, God, forgive these folks. They don't know what they're doing. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit as they pelted rocks against his body. That whole experience of following the career of Jesus has woken up the church, the baby church, to just how costly and how important their message is. And so you and I could ask the baby church, is your trust in God based upon something valuable? So let's hear from this reading from Acts of the Apostles now. We can begin to wonder how they would answer the question. Why don't we just come up? from the book of Acts. The same day that Stephen was martyred, a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation after him, over him. But Saul was ravaging the church by entering house after house, dragging off both men and women who committed them now those who were scattered went from place to place, proclaiming the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah to them. The crowd with one accord listened eagerly to what was said by Philip, hearing and seeing the signs that he did, or unseen spirits, crying with loud screams, came out of many who were possessed, and many others were paralyzed or lame and cured. Though there was great joy. Now a certain man named Simon had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he was someone great. And they listened eagerly to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. When they believed Philip, who was proclaiming the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were not high, both men and women, even Simon himself. After being baptized, he stayed constantly with the Jews who were still there, and was amazed when he saw the sign of the great miracle that took place. Now, when the apostles of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. The two went down and prayed for them that, that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet the Spirit had not come upon any of them, they had only been baptized. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands. He offered them one, saying, Give me also this power, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. 
they receive the Holy Spirit. For Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain God's gift with you. You have no part or share in this, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord, that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are the gall of bitterness and the chains of wickedness. Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may happen to me. Now after Peter and John had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, proclaiming the good news to many villages of Samaria. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. that the death of Stephen brought the proclamation of God's kingdom and the good news of Jesus Christ to a new level. Instead of trying to silence the people who had lived in Jerusalem who had heard the message of Jesus, they scattered, yes, perhaps out of fear, perhaps out of self-preservation, and then out into the countryside, out into Samaria, they proclaimed the good news. There was hated Samaritans, those who were almost identical cousins to Judaism and yet so despised by Jews, there they found, well, audience. Who would have thought that the death of one could reveal the life of many? <coughs> Remember that the first witnesses of the resurrection had a shared personal experience of Jesus, both crucified and risen. And based upon this invaluable experience, God trusted those first witnesses to proclaim the good news, not as doctrine or information or theology, but as an announcement that nothing can stand in the way of revealing God's love for us. Not death, not fear, not sin, not weakness, not corruption, nothing. Trust of the apostles in God was based upon this priceless power of Christ's cross and resurrection. And by the urging of the Spirit, the church was going to declare how much the Spirit had already done in people's lives, and then he was going to continue declaring how much there was yet to do 2,000 years later. Not even the smallest act of goodness was going to die in the sight of God. That, to me, is one of the most profound things that you can say to one who is ready to lose hope, to one who is facing death and persecution, to one whose life seems like it's fading away. Not even the smallest act of goodness is going to die because in Christ all goodness, all love, all compassion lives forever because it reflects and reveals God who will not die. And as the baby church was reflecting upon the career of Jesus by his healing and his teaching and his proclamation of the good news, they realized that all of the mercy and all of the love and all of the sharing and all of the compassion that they were participating in there was also never coming to die. And so now after the death of Stephen, now as people in the region of Samaria and are beginning to experience the gospel life, a deathless life, the church starts to realize death and fear and sin are not going to stop this message. Well, church, I'm sharing with you what I believe is the priceless foundation of our trust in God. All of the ways that we can trust in God lead to this. There's a life of goodness, a life of love, a life of mercy and justice and compassion that God invites us into and says, you know what, it is not going to die. And I have given you my son as a living flesh and blood messenger of that truth. In that way, the 
Spirit of God is going to make you courageous to do the same thing over and over again to a world that really, really needs that message. And when I say this to you, I hope that you can hear, well, how much Simon the Magician's request for power in the Spirit seems so lame and so pathetic. Because you cannot own this power, you can't manage it, you can't make it come out of your hands, no. It lives in you. When you are needed to be merciful and loving and reconciling and healing, when you are being called upon as individuals and as community in this world to reveal the love of God, that power of God possesses you and lives in your heart, lives in our hearts as community. When I share this foundation of our trust in God, I hope you sense that no matter your struggles, no matter your questions in life, no matter your hurts, no matter the need that you have for God's healing, no matter your struggles, you know there is a God who lives with you. And despite any person's brokenness or weakness or sin, God's goodness, God's love, God's compassion, stirs within you will never die. I hope you value that trust in God above all things. And I hope, church, that with your own complete being, your body and your soul and your spirit and everything that is within you, you share all the good that God has done for you. Amen?